so honored to be here with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and to thank John Perkins and his family for their witness. Um, I'm just, you've admired you for decades, and you've been a role model and a mentor, so it's wonderful to share this evening with all of you and with the Perkins family. So um, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm a child of the Baptist Church. I am the granddaughter and daughter and sister and aunt of Baptist ministers. Justice for children and the poor is my ministry because that was what all the right children were taught by our parents and our church and our community elders. When my mother died, a white man in my hometown asked me what I did. I realized as I replied that I do exactly what my parents did, just on a different scale and in different arenas. Mom and Daddy would be very pleased that our old parsonage in Bennettsville, South Carolina is the curriculum development laboratory where the Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools across the country, which took the concept from the Civil Rights era of 1964, Erin Perkins, and we put a very rigorous integrated reading curriculum beneath it and training and freedom schools have served over 50,000 children. I'm often, I'm so pleased because people say, where are the black males? And I said, well, thousands of them have been, been out there teaching black children and brown and Latino children and white children in freedom schools. And this last summer we had 102 and you're going to freedom schools across the country in 49 cities. And at the end, you're going to see a video about our choices as a people as to whether we're going to continue to siphon off children into a prison, cradle to prison pipeline, or whether we're going to try to give them a new sense of hope and rebuild the kinds of community, beloved communities that you all reflect. And everybody needs to operate freedom schools in their communities, and black churches need to open those church doors wide, and all churches and mosques during idle summer months and after school hours to teach all of our children that we care, to teach them their history and their culture. I was appreciative of having the chance um, to hear about your Nehemiah fellows. And our children need to know their heritage of struggle and faith and they need the literacy and citizenship skills that they're going to have to have to struggle today and tomorrow for social and economic equality. When I was growing up, people often ask me, and I'm sure they ask you that often, why, why do you do what you do? And I said, it never occurred to me not to do what I do. Um, growing up, service was as much a part of my living and my daily life as eating and sleeping and going to school. Things were not wonderful in the Old South, as you will learn from the history of the Perkins' books, but black adults served as buffers against the segregated prison of the outside world that told me as a young black girl that I wasn't much, was worth very much. But I didn't believe it because my parents said it wasn't so. My teachers told me it wasn't so, and my preacher, my daddy, told me it wasn't so. So the childhood message that I internalized was that as God's child, no man or woman could look down on me, and I could look down on no man or woman. All of the blacks of my era, we couldn't play in the segregated public playgrounds or sit at drugstore lunch counters, so daddy built a playground and a canteen behind our church. Whenever he and my mama saw a need, they try to respond as you try to respond to the needs of your neighbors around you. There were no black homes for the aged, so my parents began one across the street, and our whole family had to help out. And I sure didn't like it at the time, but that was how I learned that it was my responsibility to take care of elderly family members and neighbors and that everyone was my neighbor. Black church and community members were watchful, extended, parents. Children were community property. They reported on me when I did wrong and they applauded when I did well. And I still haven't forgiven Deacon Harris Harrington to this day for reporting on me when I was someplace I had no business being. 
And they were very clear about what doing well meant. It meant being helpful to others. It meant achieving in school. It meant reading. And all the right children figured out very early on that the only time Daddy wouldn't give us a chore was when we were reading, so we all read a lot. <laughs> children were taught by example that nothing was too lowly to do and that the work of our heads and hands were both equally valuable. And as a young child, I remember a debate between my mama and my daddy as to whether I was too young to go with my older brother, Harry, to clean the bed sores of a poor sick woman. And I learned then, at seven, my daddy won just how much the smallest helping hands can mean to a person in need. Our families, our religious congregations, our communities, despite all the negative signals of the outside world, made our children feel useful and important. And while life was often hard and resources scarce, we always knew who we were and that what was important was inside our heads and hearts and not outside in personal possessions or ambition. We knew the world had a lot of problems, but that we could struggle and change them. And that those of us who had more had the privilege and responsibility of sharing with others less fortunate. And I'm so grateful for these childhood legacies of a living faith, the discipline of hard work, the capacity to struggle in the face of adversity. Reverend Perkins, when I want to get, not get up in the morning, I think about Ms. Mabur at the Carter and Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer and Ms. Winston Hudson. And I find that I can get on up and try again because many young people today don't know what hard is. They don't know what the sacrifices are. And so the legacies of those folk really stick with me. My elders had grit. They valued family life and rituals, and they tried to be and expose us to good role models. And they taught us, and it was not the ones with the PhDs and the education, though education was valued. But I was so grateful to understand from my community women who didn't have a whole lot of education, but they were very, very clear that what was important was inside, and they transmitted the message of Jesus. They shared what little they had, and they made clear to us by the special grace of their lives what Christ taught us, what Tolstoy taught us, what Gandhi taught us, and that is that the kingdom of God is within. And every day, I still try to get up and be half as good as those ordinary people of grace who shared what they had with others. We need to convey some similar messages to our children today. We don't hear from enough religious folk. We don't hear from enough parents. I love Howard Thurman's story in one of his books when he once described an oak tree in his backyard with leaves that each autumn turned yellow and died, but they stayed on the branches all winter. And nothing, neither wind, storm, sleet, nor snow could dislodge those dead leaves from the apparently lifeless branches. And Dr. Thurman said he came to understand that the business of the oak tree during the long winter was to hold on to the dead leaves before turning them loose in spring so that the new buds, the growing edge, could begin to unfold so it winters in. What wind and storm and sleet or snow could not force off pass quietly away to become the tree's nourishment. And when I think back on my parents, I believe that they were like that oak tree. They hung on to us children until we could blossom on our own and always put our needs ahead of their own. When I think of them, I think of integrity and consistency and high expectations and rituals, the regularity of family life. It's amazing how few times many American families ever sit down to have a meal together. Children don't learn how to set the table because we, don't, we all go off to McDonald's. We need to go through these rituals of taking responsibility for running households and responsibility for each other. We had chores, we had church activities, we had study, we had reading, we had service, we had play. And we also were taught common sense and sound choices. We were taught sacrifice and a bedrock faith of a gratitude and belief in the graciousness and presence of the creator who gave us life. I love reading my daddy's will. He didn't leave us any money, but he entrusted us 
to our gracious creator whom he knew would never leave us alone. And the last thing he said, you are never alone. His last sermon was from the 139th Psalm. There's nowhere you can go that God is not. And that is really very important that we give our children a faith that transcends all. Daddy never raised his voice in the pulpit. And he tried to educate our congregation's mind as well as touch its hearts, which is why these kinds of gatherings are so important. And he taught that faith required action and that action could be sustained only by faith in the face of daily discouragement and injustice in our segregated Southern society. And one of the things that I saw all growing up every Sunday and every time I went into our church was a picture Daddy put up because we always had a sense that we belonged to the whole world. But there was a picture in our church vestibule of a huge crowd of emaciated brown people standing around a table where a few white people were sitting laden with food. And the caption under that picture was, Shall We Say Grace? And I've always thought about that in the middle of plenty, that those who had much did not see that they were put on this earth to share it with those who didn't have enough. I look back now and I see that my concern for safe places for children to play and swim comes from the lack of public playgrounds for black children in my childhood and our exclusion from the swimming pool near our home where we could see white children splashing happily I just remember as if it was yesterday how my childhood friend died jumping off the bridge into the pond, into the creek, broke his neck, um, which I later learned that our creek was the hospital sewage outlet. I almost drowned in a public lake in Chiraw, South Carolina, which lacked adequate lifeguard surveillance. I remember now my passion still for health care, and let me just say I hope you're going to join me. There's a petition outside because next year, as the child health insurance program comes up for reauthorization, it expires. We've got nine million uninsured children in this country and it's time to stop it. We need to have health coverage for every child. And the fact that little Johnny Harrington died because he stepped on a nail and didn't get a tetanus shot, you know, little Johnny Harrington is still dying today and we need to stop it because we need to give every child health care. And I think back at the time when my daddy and I stood in the middle of the night watching an ambulance, white ambulance, turn around, leave a black migrant family laying out on the highway after they came and found that the black family were the only ones that were injured and the white truck driver didn't need it, didn't need any help. And I never, ever lost that image. And my concern for children without homes and parents unable to care for them comes from the foster children taken that I, were taken into our home. I have over 12 foster sisters and brothers and I'm still to this day ashamed of my resentment and jealousy when I was asked to share my room with a homeless child for a few days. But as I grew older, I began to understand what community was about and I'm very grateful. Today I am often asked what's wrong with our children. Children having children. Children killing children. Children killing others, children killing themselves. Children roaming streets alone or in gangs all day and night. Children floating through life like driftwood on a beach. Children addicted to tobacco and alcohol and heroin and cocaine and pot drinking and drugging themselves to death to escape reality. Children running away from home and being thrown away by parents. Children being locked up in jails with adult criminal menace are all alone. Children dying of AIDS, children bubbling with a rage and crushed by depression. What's wrong with our children? Well, adults are what's wrong with our children. Parents letting children raise themselves or be raised by others. Children being shaped by peers and gangs instead of by parents and grandparents and kin. And let me just say as a new grandmama, I just cannot tell you how much I admire these grandparents struggling to raise children. My grandchildren are coming tomorrow night. And I am so tired after they leave. I love them to death. 
But I don't know how the 70 and 75 and 80 year old grandparents and there are about 4 million trying to raise those grandchildren without adequate help make it and we need to provide them the supports they need to take care of those children. <laughs> children are roaming the streets because there's nobody at home. Children are going to drug houses that are always open and set up to school houses and church houses that are too often closed. How many hours of the day are our doors open? The gangs are there 24-7. How many hours are our doors open in our religious congregations? Which is why, again, I just thank so many of you for your work in trying to reach out and to be present in, for those in need. Children see adults be violent to each other and to them. We are always wrong with our children. We tell our children one thing and we do another. We make promises we don't keep and we preach what we don't practice. We tell children to control themselves while slapping and spanking. Adults tell children to be honest while lying and cheating. We adults tell children not to be violent while marketing and glorifying violence and tolerating a culture that's just saturated with violence. Turn off those TV sets and turn off those violent videos and speak up against the incessant marketing of violence to our children. We tell our children to be healthy while we sell them junk food and addict them to smoke and drink and careless sex. We're what's wrong with our children and I hope that God will help us to repent. Now our children don't expect us to be perfect and parenting is the most challenging and important job in the world. But it's time for adults of every race and income group to break our silence about the pervasive breakdown of moral and family and community and national and cultural values to place our children first in our lives and to struggle to model the behavior we want our children to lose. Because we don't, and I want to repeat it, we do not have a child or a youth problem in America. We have a profound adult problem. And we adults need to clean up the weeds in our lives and begin to be what we want our children to be. James Baldwin, the great writer, said very clearly a long time ago that our children very seldom do what we tell them to do, but they almost always do what we do. So we just need to do this audit and to see how we can begin to reclaim our children by reclaiming our own faith and reclaiming our own commitment. If we lie and don't tithe any of our money for the poor, our children are not going to do it either. If they see us telling or tolerating racial jokes or gender jokes, any jokes intended to demean another human being, they'll do the same thing too. If they see us spending all of our money on clothes and cars and not giving it to the poor or sharing what we have, they're going to grow up doing the same thing. So they're trying to begin to give them the signals of what we want them to become through our example is very important. And while thanking us all for our charity and our service, which is a mandate of being a trying to be a Christian, I also want to talk about the importance of our standing up for our children when others mistreat them in the choices we make in our budgets and in our policies. And it was adults, not a lot of them, but in the middle of all that segregation, there were brave people who were risking their lives and struggling to sue um, to bring about a better equitable education, a more equitable education for children who were unbelievably brave in trying to get the right to vote. And so I remember those examples of the few incredibly encouraging and courageous people who stood up because they wanted children to have a better life, and our children need that from us today. The test of the morality of a society, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian who died opposing Hitler's Holocaust, said is how it treats its children. And America is flunking Bonhoeffer's test every hour of every day. That we let a child be abused or neglected every 35 seconds. We have so many abused children in this country every year that we could fill up the city of Detroit. God has blessed us with extraordinary riches, and yet we let a child be born into poverty every 36 seconds in this country. Our 13 million children are the poorest age group in America, and about six, over 6 million children live in extreme poverty. We can do better than that. And children are getting poorer. And, and the group of extremely poor children 
has increased even though the child poverty rate stagnated this year after increasing for four years consecutively. If you don't have an education in this country, you're going to be sentenced to death. You're just a sentence to social death. And yet we let a child drop out of school every nine seconds of every school day. The half million children who dropped out just in the most recent day, year, would fill up the state of New Mexico. And we've got millions and millions and millions of children coming home alone after school, going through summer months. And we've just done our Freedom School debrief down at the Alex Haley Farm, which is our training center and center for spiritual renewal. And I was amazed how many children reported so much hunger still. And for the first time, we had children coming in asking to take food home and how upset they were but they were going to be ending after only six weeks, and one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that that summer feeding program, which is a 100% federal program funded, but hunger does not stop in June when children stop school, and we need to open up and give jobs and cook these children meals and build educational enrichment around it, but it's just not acceptable. But so many children are left with nothing to do during idle summer months and go hunger, hungry in this wealthy nation. Now, these figures really relate to all children of all races, but poor and minority children face a special burden. And I am deeply concerned about what is happening among poor black and Latino children. A black boy today, as many of you may know, has a one in three chance of going to prison in his lifetime. This is a national and human catastrophe. Black girl has a 1 in 18 chance. And we've got to begin to confront this cradle to prison pipeline, and I look forward to sharing our report with you in the next several months. But we've got to wake up and name it and change it. We've got to deal with the criminalization of our children at younger and younger ages. Sometimes I think that we adults have lost our senses when we have police come into a school and handcuff a six-year-old in Florida at the hands and at the ankles for behaviors that would have been solved on school grounds in previous times. I've had judges call me up to say that the children are so little I can't even see their heads over the desk. But we need to begin to think about how we deal with this. We need to deal with the disparities in all of our systems, from health care to education to early childhood, because the combination of children being born into poor and stressed and often dysfunctional families, the lack of community health and mental health services, Failing schools, zero tolerance school discipline policies, tougher sentencing guidelines, too few positive mentors and alternatives to the street, all add up to an unlevel playing field at many, many stages of our lives. And you look at children who are young black folk who come into contact with the juvenile justice and the criminal justice system, young men, young black men who are picked up for a drug offense are 48 times more likely to be sentenced and detain than young white men for the exact same offense. Latino youth nine times more likely to be incarcerated than white youth for the same drug offenses. We need to begin to speak up, and it also is so important, and that's already been alluded to here, we've got to educate our children and give them a sense of hope and a different sense of what their future can be. And when I just think, every time I think about it, that only 13% of black children, 15% of Latino, and 41% of white fourth graders are reading at grade level, and comparable figures are doing at eighth grade what they have to do at grade level in math, we really do have a problem that we are going to address. Bottom line is that these are not acts of God. These facts are our choices as a people. And while we engage in our service, we've all got, so got to be speaking up for just treatment for all of our children. I very seldom go through a speech without quoting Sojourner Truth, who just had a knack for getting right to the point about things. And one day Sojourner was speaking out um, when she heard an old a white man in an audience talking about how wonderful the Constitution was. And she responded to him by alluding to a boll weevil epidemic that it, it had destroyed thousands of acres of crops in the Midwest that year. And she said in response to his laudatory comments about the United States government and constitution, that she said, I goes out and I talks to God in the fields and the woods. And this morning, I was walking out and I got over the fence. I saw the wheat a holding up its head looking very big. I goes up and I takes hold of it. 
and you believe it, there was no wheat there. And I ask God, what is the matter with this here wheat? And he says to me, Sojourner, there's a little weasel in it. And she says, now I hear us talking about the Constitution and the rights of man, and I take hold of this Constitution, and it looks mighty big, and I feels for my rights, but there ain't no rights there. Then I says, God, what ails this Constitution? And he says, Sojourner, there's a little weasel in it. Well, I want to just say to you that there are some big weasels in our Constitution and in our governmental choices today, and that speaking up about them and challenging them and speaking truth to power is as much a part of our Christian responsibility as helping our neighbor next door. And I have no doubt that Jesus would be challenged his choices that take from the rich, take from the poor, to give to the rich, and the integrity of the prophets and the gospels are at stake. And I want to just name two or three of these weasels before I get on to what we should do. <laughs> and the first weasel, and we just really need to really just deal with this because we are at the widest gap in history between rich and poor, both in our since. We've been keeping data between those in the world and those in our own country, and that gap is growing unless we somehow begin to step into the breach. But this is the powerful special interest weasel that demands and gets first call on government resources at the expense of poor children and the powerless. And I want to be clear, this is not about class warfare, and I don't begrudge anybody. They're first, second, fifth, or tenth million, or even billion. If they are earned on a fair playing field and after we have no more hungry, sick, uneducated children in this country. But something is not right and is out of balance when just three of our wealthiest Americans possess greater wealth than the tax revenues of 25 states with almost 50 million citizens and where 347 billionaires in our nation have wealth equivalent to over almost 3 billion people in our 88 poorest nations. Those 3 billionaires and others in the top 1% of super rich Americans did not need the huge tax cuts the administration and Congress gave them in 2001. They did not need another huge set of tax cuts in 2004 or in 2005, and would you believe it, one is still trying to get the estate tax repeal, even still, it's going to gut our nation's revenue base for decades to come, it's going to choke our children and grandchildren with debt, much of which is being held by foreign countries, and you and I have an obligation, if we care about our children's health and education and early childhood and after school and the housing for our neighbors who are out on the streets, we've got an obligation to just come together and with one united voice say no more tax cuts for rich people and no more budget cuts for poor people. It's not right. And I have... But we need to find our voice and as we draft a bill to cover all children with health care next year to consolidate and have one program so that parents are not running to Medicaid over here and the chip over here and are falling through the breaches I don't want to hear anybody tell me we don't have enough money if we freeze the tax cuts just for the millionaires with an people with an average million the top one percent we can lift every child out of poverty and we can give every child health care. So don't let anybody tell you we cannot afford to give our children health care. And I hope you will break it up. Two other very brief weasels, and I've got 12 or 15 that I talk about when I write about them. But I really want to get us back because we're in the middle of constant fear mongering or people, we all want to be safe. But we really do have to deal with the insatiable military weasel. And Dr. King warned us over and over again, even as we want protection against terrorists and those who threaten our safety within and without, he warned about our continuing to invest more and more in weapons of death when millions of people in America and around the world need weapons of life. They need peace and food and housing and clean water and health care and jobs and economic development and poverty eradication. So don't please 
lose sight of the values that the man we say we worship would be speaking up about today. I want to just deal with one last weasel, and that is the charity can substitute for justice weasel. And that is something all of us in this room are engaged in charity. I'm always so moved by hearing the stories of those of you who are working in the trenches and looking at what this very organization represents. But let's don't ever get confused that charity can make up for justice. All the charity in the world cannot provide equitable school funding for all the children who need an education. It cannot provide all the housing that is needed for all of those who are without housing. And Rebecca Blank, an economist out of the University of Wisconsin, said if, if you didn't have just government policies or those who claim that you can make up with charity what you get cut in government, that it would require the religious community, every one just for welfare and SSI and food stamp, would require the charitable sector were picking it up, every one of the 258,000 religious congregations to raise an additional $300,000 a year in all future years. That's not going to happen. Jesus didn't say just charity. He talked about justice. Our Constitution and, and Declaration of Independence doesn't say liberty and charity for all. It says liberty and justice for all. So while we continue our charitable work, which is required of us as Christians, we must also continue our calls for justice and right choices for our children and for the orphans and the widows who are the least among us. And so let's really begin to talk about how we form a movement to rechange and reset the moral compass of this nation and see how we can give all of our children hope. Children should not be the poorest group of Americans. Children should not be going hungry in this rich nation. Children should not be going homeless in this rich nation. And you and I can change that. Let me just end before I show the two videos on the prison, the cradle of prison pipeline and the two greatest driving forces behind the cradle of prison pipeline. Well, we need to have personal responsibility and adults need to get our acts together. Children don't come in pieces. Children live in families, families live in communities, communities are affected by the culture and by the choices of their nation and we've got to work on all fronts and it's not an either or. But this has been a very hard period for so many and I again want to just thank all of you who continue to labor in the vineyard. You're doing God's work and God will pay us and so we should not get weary. And while we need to have big, big changes, I just hope that we will renew our commitment to caring and serving because it is the most important thing we can do in our lives. And so a prayer that I want to end with is about caring and being willing to serve. And I've always felt so lucky to have been born in an era where we had such extraordinary voices saying, I care and I'm willing to serve. And Dr. King, the first time I ever heard him in, in chapel, and one of the things I liked about him at Spelman College was he always made very clear that we didn't have to see the whole stairway to step out in faith, take that first step. But it was important that we all keep moving and never give in to our fear or never give in to discouragement. And I remember him saying over and over again in many, many speeches when I was a young woman, you know, if you can't fly, Drive. If you can't drive, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But keep moving. And so I hope we will draw on that faith of our elders. And we don't all have to learn how to preach like Dr. King. And most of us can't recite poetry like Dr. Angelou. But we can care and we can continue to be willing to serve no matter how hard it gets. I wish I had Fred Shuttlesworth's courage or Elder Roosevelt's political skills, I don't, but I know we can all say I care. And I'm willing to serve and to work with people and stand up together to build a movement for children. We don't have to sing like Miss Hamer or be able to organize like Ella Baker and Byrd Rustin, though I wish I could, but we can all come together and put our talents in the pool and say we're going to build that movement and be willing to serve and stand for children. I love looking at Desmond Tutu, and I wish I had his joyfulness and his resilience, and I wish I was forgiving like President Mandela, or disciplined like Mahatma Gandhi, but I'm not, but I think like you, I can say I care, and I'm willing to serve and stand together with others to build a movement for our children. 
not brilliant like Dr. Du Bois or as eloquent as Sojourner Truth and Booker T. Washington, but I care. And I'm willing to serve and to work with you and anybody who cares about the poor and about justice to build a movement for our children. God is not as easy as in the 60s to frame an issue and forge a solution, but we can all say we're going to keep trying in all the new complexes. We're going to learn how to read these budgets, and we're going to learn how to do whatever we've got to do to lobby, even as we learn how to live in community where we are and say we care and we're willing to serve and we're willing to work together to build a movement. Many older people say my body and body and mind are not so swift as in youth and my energy comes in spurts. But when it comes in those spurts, you say I care and I'm willing to serve and I'm willing to pick up the phone and say don't you make choices that hurt my grandchildren. Many young people don't know how to stand up and fight because they haven't seen adults fight with them. And one of the things I loved is that adults didn't tell us to go to church, they took us to church. And they didn't tell us to go out and do this, they went with us to vote. I went every time my daddy went to vote. And so we need to tell my ch our children who say I'm so young and nobody's going to listen, not sure what to do or say, you need to say yes you do and I'm going to care enough about you to teach you what to say and teach you how to care and show you how to serve and take you with me. And that's why your fellowship programs and your mentoring programs are so wonderful. Many people say I can't see or hear well. I don't speak good English. I stutter sometimes. I get real scared standing up before others. Get scared, stand up anyway, and say I care. And I'm willing to serve and to speak up and to vote and to build a movement for children. And as you go back home after this wonderful experience, this wonderful conference of sharing, your wonderful work, I hope you will continue to be encouraged and to ask God to use you and to use all of us as God wills to save our children today and tomorrow and to build a nation and a world where no child is left behind and every child is valued as a sacred child that they are. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do. I hope you will look at this Cradle to Prison Pipeline video. It will be available when the report is released. And I hope you will look at the Freedom School video and see whether this is a model that you might want to bring to your communities. Our children need us to reclaim them and to be there for them. And I thank you for your service and for your witness.